what are the foundational characteristics of blockchain systems. In other words, how are they different from traditional IT systems? Firstly, in conventional IT, uh, systems are centrally owned, managed and operated. Whereas in blockchain, uh, this is really a set of peer nodes that don't know each other, that don't trust each other. Uh, they come together and agree on the common state of a database. So there is trust built into the network. Secondly, in terms of security, the very nature of traditional systems means that data is stored on centralized servers and it makes it very attractive for a hacker to attempt to steal data. And once this hacker gets access to that server, pretty much the entire database uh, is accessible. Now in conventional, I mean in blockchain systems, uh, the very nature of the P2P architecture means that a hacker has to attempt to break into not just one computer, but an entire network of computers and the two simultaneously and change the data. Clearly that is a that is tall order. Third, in terms of privacy, traditional IT systems have got a very fine grained level of access control that you can define at the database level and application level. Whereas in public blockchain systems, uh, this, uh, these features are not available. The transactions are visible uh, to anyone who joins the network. But uh, the transactions are tied to arbitrary public key addresses. So in that sense, they are pseudonymous and uh, you don't tie it back to a name directly. Fourth, uh, in, in uh, blockchain systems, digital assets can be uniquely identified they can be transferred and they can be tracked as they move from person to person. Uh, this facility is not available in conventional IT technologies. Fifth, in traditional IT, uh, a database administrator who has access rights sufficiently can actually go and modify any transaction. Uh, it's very difficult to, to prevent that. But in uh, blockchain, you don't trust any individual. So there is no way that uh, uh, somebody can go and uh, tamper the database uh, without the others knowing about it. So in that sense, uh, the transactions are immutable. Fifth, in terms of transparency and auditability, in central IT, unless you have access to the system, you can't see the data. You have to rely on someone to give you the right level of access at the right time. Whereas in blockchain, all the data is open, publicly visible to people. They can audit, audit it transparently. In terms of durability and robustness, any transaction can be deleted by a centralized administrator of a database in a conventional IT system. So the, there can be no record that a transaction ever took place if, if you go and delete it from the database. But in uh, blockchain, this is not possible. Once a transaction gets onto the blockchain, it is permanently there. You can only append to the blockchain. You can't modify the previous transactions or delete them. Sixth, uh, blockchain uniquely enables self-executing contracts where you can enforce the rules of the contract in software code and have that uh, executed automatically. And lastly, uh, because of the nature of uh, blockchain systems, there is an economic model built in uh, to incentivize the participants to keep the system going and to follow the rules of the game. So uh, I hope this gives, this gives an idea of how a traditional IT uh, client server based system is different from a blockchain system. For all the benefits that public blockchains offer, they still don't meet the requirements of enterprise customers. Due to this, there has been a divergence in the architecture of blockchains which has led to the creation of a new category called permissioned blockchains. Let's first look at the similarities between permissionless and permissioned. Both of them are first of all decentralized P2P networks where each participant maintains a replica of a shared ledger with digitally signed transactions. Also both maintain the data in sync across nodes through a protocol called consensus. And 
both provide guarantees on the immutability of the ledger. Then what sets them apart? Enterprise customers have got some unique requirements. Number one is the requirement for confidentiality. Uh, in, a, in a consortium type of uh, blockchain where an industry group comes together, who may be competitors, it, uh, it is very important to maintain the confidentiality of individual transactions. Only entities participating in a transaction should get to know about it and any others should be given access only on a need basis. And uh, this is very important because if you share more information than needed, it could put your organization at a competitive disadvantage. So confidentiality is a primary requirement which cannot be met with the current architecture of public blockchains. Second requirement is throughput. We've seen that uh, both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have throughputs which are far lower, actually orders of magnitude lower than uh, what today's uh, traditional IT systems deliver. So uh, the, there is a need for permission blockchains to have throughput similar uh, to what is possible with regular IT systems. And uh, this has led to making some decisions, uh, architectural decisions in the permissioned uh, uh, blockchains that improves the throughput uh, of transactions at the cost of decentralization. One of one such thing is uh, the adoption of different types of consensus protocols. And also there are other techniques that are uh, uh, used by permission blockchains, including things like off-chain storage of data, etc. Third is transaction latency. How much time does it take to confirm a transaction before you get the guarantee that transaction is irreversible? In public blockchains like Bitcoin, it takes a minimum of 10 minutes to confirm a transaction, but it's recommended to wait for an hour to be absolutely sure. In Ethereum, it takes a little less, but the transaction latency is still much higher than what you can achieve in today's uh, payment networks. So in order for uh, blockchain based systems to be viable in the enterprise setup, it is very important for transaction latencies also to come down uh, to similar levels like what's possible uh, in, in regular IT. So what they do is uh, in permission blockchains, they go for voting based consensus uh, where when a majority of the nodes vote for a transaction, then uh, the transaction is deemed to be confirmed. And also because the number of participants is lower than a public network, this process tends to be much uh, quicker. Permission blockchains are of two types a consortium where a group of external partners or an, a group of uh, participants in an industry come together for a common purpose to share, uh, share some data and achieve efficiencies. The second type is a private permission blockchain where the blockchain is owned by an individual or an entity. Some people say that uh, private permission blockchains are really not blockchains because you're going back to the centralized model. But regardless, uh, you know, the, this, these uh, variations continue to exist. It's very important to highlight that uh, the, this category of uh, permissionless versus permissioned consortium and permissioned private blockchains, the categories tend to evolve and uh, hybrid models uh, are coming up. Uh, for example, Ethereum, uh, which is a public blockchain, has formed an alliance with uh, the various enterprise users and technology providers. It's called an Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, where they have come out with a specification to agree to incorporate uh, enterprise features into the public blockchain as extensions. Likewise, in permission blockchains, uh, in consortium blockchains, some of them, they, while they restrict the number of participants who can actually uh, uh, create transactions and do mining, uh, 
some of them allow public to view all the transactions. So as you can see, the categories uh, are not cast in stone and they evolve very, very rapidly because the needs of different industries is different and the needs of different enterprise use cases uh, also drives some of these architectural decisions. With this, we come to the conclusion of this introduction to blockchain module. Let's quickly recap. We saw the evolution of the internet from web 1.0 to 2.0 and now moving to 3.0. We also saw the different generations of blockchains, the first generation being Bitcoin and the second generation being Ethereum and uh, third generation work is actively in progress. We saw the various components of a blockchain, distributed ledger, cryptography, P2P network, consensus mechanisms and financial incentives. While all of these are not new concepts, they have been brought together in a very innovative manner by blockchain. We've also seen technically what is the unique characteristic that uh, blockchain brings, which is not possible with other technologies. And that is uh, bringing digital scarcity to assets uh, and uh, elimination of intermediaries, uh, creating a, a network that generates trust. We also saw the six possibilities uniquely enabled by blockchain due to these two technical characteristics. Um, we saw the characteristics of open blockchains, the foundational characteristics, how they differ from traditional IT systems. And uh, last, uh, we looked at the differences between permissioned and uh, permissionless blockchains and their architectural implications. With this, we conclude this module. Let's now get ready to go to the heart of this course, the deep dive into the technical principles of blockchain. I'll see you soon.